Osiris. Our bass player at the time, Sean, he was in Greece with his best friend hanging out. Our guitar player, Andrew Wesson, was there surfing. And our drummer at the time was visiting after college. We were all in this little town and started making music, which is pretty amazing. Hi, this is Maggie Rose. You're listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. Salute the Songbird is a platform for women in music to share their stories and let their voices be heard. And everyone has a seat at the table. Hey everybody, welcome to Salute the Songbird. I'm your host, Maggie Rose. And before we begin, I have to thank you for your response to the release of Have a Seat. I've waited for a very long time to share this music with you. As some of you know, I recorded it at Fame Studios in 2019. And because of the events that we all shouldn't even mention, like Voldemort, I finally got to put it out on August 20th. And it feels so good to give it away to you. We had a big party in Nashville, Tennessee at Brooklyn Bowl. And of course, I've seen you out on the Have a Seat tour, and you make it all possible. So what a dream. This is such a really exciting time for all of us, and you're all making that possible. So thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks for listening to and streaming the record Have a Seat. Now today, I have a treat for you, and she is an artist in every sense of the word. She's Lady Group Love of the band Group Love with her fellow bandmates and her husband, Christian Zucconi, Daniel Gleason. Ben Hamala and Andrew Wesson. And she's also a visual artist who does all of the band's artwork for all of their releases. And she has quite a story. She had a pretty profound health scare, which is just one small part of her very full life. I actually spoke with her a day after she made a huge move from Los Angeles to Atlanta with her husband Christian and her young daughter Willa. And she just has an amazing perspective as she walks through this life in her very unique role as an artist, as a mother, as a creator of all this great music. And I spoke to her after the release of their surprise fifth album, This Is This, which was released on the heels of their Grammy-nominated album, Healer. And they did this all by themselves. The band, very self-sufficient, just decided to make music because that's how they got through a very tough time. So... Without further ado, we're going to talk to the badass herself, Miss Hannah Hooper. So to take you back, I was living in New York and I was painting full time. I had this little studio in Chinatown and my studio mate who was super hip and like a DJ was like, you got to come see this band tonight. And I had my first solo show coming up and I was like, I can't leave. He was like, no, you need to get out of the studio. So he took me to the show and I saw Christian singing and it was just love at first sight. It was like, honestly, there was a light around him the way I remember it. And I was just like, I need to meet this guy. And as someone who, you know, had been in several relationships and always sort of thought, oh, I think what people mean by love is like, you just make a friend and date them. Like this was a new feeling seeing Christian. It was, it really was. I'd fallen in love with someone and I fall in love with the artist first, which is for me so important. We hung out after and we just had this. I couldn't believe, first of all, that I was hanging out with him right after the show. We got pizza and we hung out all night talking and stuff. And literally, I want to say it was like 48 hours after that, I was invited to go to a painting residency in Greece. And I remember being like, if I go on this residency, I will lose touch with this guy. Like I'm totally in love. And so I asked the person, I mean, this is such a big opportunity as a painter too. And I was just like, can I bring another artist? And they said, yeah, this is a genuine artist. You can bring them. And so I called Christian. Oh my gosh. It was kind of crazy. I was like, Hey, I know we just met. 
I'm feeling very strong feelings for you. And I'm wondering if you would want to come spend the summer with me in Greece at an artist residency. And he just like, honestly, these balls did not exist before I met him. That's the thing. I was just like, I was just living in this state of love. And I just remember the silence felt so long. And he's like, fuck it. Let's go. Oh my (laughs) God. Yeah. Next thing I know, we're on this plane to Greece together. And we both had to like get rid of our apartments. I mean, we let everything go to make this trip happen because, you know, we were struggling artists in New York. And I remember just being on the plane with him and being like, I know nothing about this person. This is totally scary, actually. And when we got there, the other members of Group Love were there for different reasons. Our bass player at the time, Sean, who was from England, was in Greece with his best friend, like hanging out. Our guitar player, Andrew Wesson, was there surfing. And our drummer at the time was visiting. He was overseas from college. And so he was there and we were all in this little town and yeah, just started making music, which is pretty amazing. And I know you say that you didn't have the bravery or the balls back then, but to see you now on stage and as lady group love and all the energy that you bring, it's wild to even hear you describe yourself that way, but describe what the concept of this commune in Greece was all about, because I know you started in visual art and you continued to work in that all your album covers you've helped create, but what was the appeal of going to Crete and what did they offer you to be able to just do what you were doing? I mean, I was in New York, you know, working several jobs and it was all about like paying rent, paying for studio space. And so that obligation, I think for everyone that was there was that you were leaving behind that obligation. You had a free residency, like our housing was free. Food was essentially free. A lot of people were there to make music, but the painters were there. We just had to get supplies and we had free studio space. So it was just the idea that we could completely dedicate ourselves to our art. And also be near a beach and like, you know, just live in your art, which is what I think the goal for all artists is. And so to be able to do that, it was so liberating and it really, it just made it real to me. Like, this is exactly what I need to be doing. And it was just taking that next step. It's just taking those risks to kind of reaffirm what you already know. Did you have any ambitions to be a musical artist? Or do you think it was being so unencumbered that having those confines drop away, you realize that that is who you are? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, I was always like growing up sort of a class clown, but when I was called on in class, I got really shy and would turn bright red. So there was this performer in me, I love to entertain, but I was honestly a really shy kid at the same time. So, I mean, it's taken a long time to figure this out, but to feel myself and be honest about it and be able to entertain was just something I didn't know I had in myself. You know, I I loved painting because it was so private and then I get to reveal the piece when it's done. But to be writing with people and be vulnerable in front of people was something that I had to get accustomed to. And now that I am, it's my only real form of therapy. I was listening to an interview that you did with Jenny Ellescu, who I love, and you kind of talked about how she is the best. And you talk about how you were studying at Parsons, but you found this thrill in vandalism a little bit, and that you equate the thrill of being on stage in front of people to the thrill of graffiti art, where you're trying not to get caught. It's still beautiful, but there's something a little taboo to it, and a little rebellious, and I feel like you've struck that for sure in the music and performative work that you do with group love. But your last three albums have seemed like they are markings of really huge transformative periods in your life, like becoming a mother. And we can go as far into this as you want to, but even just health concerns that you had and overcoming that and healing and then having this amazing album healer come out and the world shut down and losing a friend. And it just feels like you're so generous with your story through your music. I wonder if there is any fear in sharing some of that. And if you could kind of 
talk about where you were with Big Mess and then how it progressed to Healer and then to This Is This. I mean, I honestly think all art, no matter what I'm doing, is to get, you know, closer to my truth and like what I'm going through in the moment. And so Big Mess, like becoming a mom. I mean, I actually wrote about it. It's funny. I recently just got back on Instagram and I wrote a little post about oxygen swimming today, but like writing and that is actually oxygen swimming is kind of from back then, but we just saved it. There was this huge fear of just not being able to handle all of it. And I definitely like used time differently before I was a mom and I just came to realize as we were writing, I was like, oh, I just have more experiences to pull on now and more feelings. And there's something actually about not having as much time that the truth comes out faster. Because if I hit a chord, tears might start falling out or I might start screaming or whatever it is that honesty comes out faster now. So I don't have the time to kind of like wallow in it. It's just like, you right. Is. Well, and you're not squandering away the stillness when it does present itself where... I think a lot of us, before we hit record, we were having technical difficulties and we're talking about social media and sequencing and of albums and just what has been deemed important now on the conventional stage. But I think that you're just kind of letting the realness dictate what you're doing in your music. And I want to have be a mother someday and it's just almost unfathomable to think of how I would factor that in, but you just do it. You do it. You know, you just make them part of it. Like Willa's on this new album. Welcome to your life is about Willa. Like it's just, she is, you know, our creation and she's just like this magical. And you know, what's amazing is like when I'm really being an artist, I'm really being a child. Like I really am. So to see her so curious and so creative all the time. And I'm like, that's where we all should be living in that state. She kind of helps me get there faster in a way, you know, and also has taught me this incredible amount of patience that I didn't think I had because I'm like, why can't you write? Like, I can't teach you how to do this. Why can't you? I'm like, oh, right. You have to learn like everything needs to be taught and it all needs to be taught with love and patience. It's a wild adventure. healer, as you know, I had brain surgery, which is crazy. I like to stack things up in my life all at the same time for some reason. So I had my first big art show. I guess big art shows always something crazy happens around that time. But I had my first solo show in Los Angeles, like Shepard Fairey's Gallery. And it was this huge deal. And I wanted to be this dramatic, like this, you know, kind of the showcase everything I could do. So I was painting these like seven foot by seven foot canvases and I was moving them around and painting on the floor and doing all this stuff. And I started like losing sensation in my, the left side of my arm and my hand. And I was like, oh, this must be because I'm bent over all day. And then I started like getting blurry in my eye and, and I was talking to Christian about it. And he was like, let's go talk to a doctor. I just remember being like, I don't have time to see a doctor right now. Like right. I was so like caught up in this deadline and I got a MRI and I remember I was actually going in to do my first photo shoot and interview for the painting show. And I got a call and was like, you have this giant cavernous malformation in your brain and you need to get brain surgery immediately. Oh my God. I didn't understand the timeline. Very crazy, actually. Because simultaneously we're recording Healer. And the night after the opening of my art show, we actually decided to perform, do a group love show that night too. And the next day, Christian and I flew to Phoenix for brain surgery. What's so wild is I pick angel cards every day. I don't know if you know what angel cards are, but I don't. It's like a deck of cards and you pick them and it will say like hope or like water or it just kind of gives you a word for the day to like lean on. So we woke up for my brain surgery, Christian, just so solid with me the whole time, not showing any fear, even though he said after he'd like lay awake at night staring at me, like her head is getting cut open in a week. And we would pick a card and I picked death that morning. And I was like, what the fuck? Like we were both like, oh my God. 
So we're, we're looking at the meaning of death for angel cards. And it's like, it means you're going to be reborn. It means that we were trying to look at it in a positive way, but that's like how we like split ways that day, which is so crazy. It was a heavy time, but I have this like weird memory of being really calm through it because first of all, I kind of knew I was going to be okay. I don't know why. I just knew I was going to be okay. And I wanted to stay in that mind frame. Also, I was really busy writing and painting. And also everyone around me was weirdly being so positive. I feel like the band and my family, just everyone was being so like, they weren't showing any fear. So it made me feel okay. And also being a mom, (laughs) I couldn't really process that. And also as someone who like in my life has sort of dealt with depression and things like that, like to have a reason to have feelings for the first to be scared and not being scared for the first time was empowering. I have a reason now like that I could really lean into and be like, but I'm getting brain surgery or like, I'm going to go Netflix all day and just get under, you know what I mean? And I didn't do that. And that was, it was a growing period for me. Cause I was like, that child in me kind of had to die. That person, that needy sort of whoever that was, it's not like she doesn't come back, but she's not as strong in me anymore. So that was the healer process. (laughs) Right. What a profound meaning to attribute to that card now in retrospect is to kind of see it as a reemergence into your new self and this art and having these people who are so solid. It's kind of wild how everyone just was there for you and perspective. You probably just got like the most hefty dose of that that you'd ever had in your life and all at once. I mean, Christian is like in so many ways, just like I learn from him every day, but he has this strength and this calmness for me, which is just so important to be around. But also in music, when we started this band, I was basically like learning and I was like Mm -hmm. harmonizing and learning how to play keyboard, learning how to write on guitar, learning. We just released This Is This. I'm singing lead on everything. And it's awesome. And it's- I love your voice on this record. Thank you. I mean, it's like, the craziest thing is, I wonder if the roles were switched like Christian the whole time was like, this is what I've been waiting for. Like just the fact that he was so supportive the whole time is just crazy to me. Like he wants everyone to be the best they can be around him. And like, obviously I want that too, but just that level of it and that calm and supportiveness of him just for everyone in our band, when someone's writing a part and I look at him and I'm like, Oh, he already knows what he would play there, but he wants to give whoever the chance of the band to write their part and, You know what I mean? It's just that's the most loving thing that anyone can do is give another the space to explore. And I know that your relationship with him is symbiotic for his music as well. And I think you're very deferential in how you talk about him helping you find your voice and learn. But you were such a willing sponge and contributor to the band's energy and everybody's I think, optimism about what you were doing. I think it's apparent that just by your fans' response that you are very much like Lady Group Love. (laughs) You are the one that people look forward to and have this magnetic energy and love to see and absorb. So I'm sure that while he was a great teacher, it takes two. And it's such an inspiring thing for me to see in how you all deal with ego because I think in a group when you are as tight knit as you are, it can be a killer. And complacency can sneak in and just not really giving a shit about it after a while with all these different challenges that arise and just them all riding the wave with you guys as parents. And of course this wasn't your choice to deal with the health challenges, but being there for you, it just it seems like you guys have something that you just don't see often with a group of people who can also successfully have relationships within the group and all of you collaborating as producers on this is this. I mean, are there ever struggles with just personality and and being that close and being the only woman in the group too? That must be wild. Honestly, it's fun. We are best friends or something. Like I want to like break down some juice, but the truth is we all count on each other. And we all are really honest with each other. So everyone knows that 
when you squash the ego, that's when the magic happens. Like, what is someone going to bring to the table? What, like, when sometimes I think a song is done and then Dan will just go in and like rip a new bass line because he doesn't like his because he's such a perfectionist. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, we're hearing a new melody. Like, it only happens with this incredible dynamic and like just trusting each other. What are some exercises that you would recommend to other groups out there who might be dealing with internal struggles or egos or insecurities? I mean, I would say first, like hang out with each other as friends and make sure that that is always good first. I like to treat the studio and sometimes I feel like a little bit uptight about this, but I like to know when people are coming into the studio, like if a friend is visiting or stuff, because if we're writing, I personally need to feel super safe because whatever, you don't know where it's going to go, you know? So I think if our friendships and our trust, and we all know where we're all at in each other's lives and like how everyone's doing, then I think the music reflects that. So if you're not hanging out with your band and you're just coming in and you're like, um, I'm like hanging out with cooler people now or whatever, you know, whatever the, I remember when the band first started, I used to get so annoyed when Andrew, our guitar player, would change his style without telling me to come in. It's all like 70s now or something. And it would bum me out. Like his aesthetic or his Yeah, like his aesthetic. Style. Like, no, his aesthetic. <laughs> it was so dumb. But I mean, we're, we're young, you know, and I just felt like I wasn't in on what was happening. I was like, oh, I thought we were all like grungy 90s kids. Now you're like the 70s suit guy. Like, I need to know this. But those kind of things can affect the way I feel in the room. I want you to speak to that, just not having people close by. And when you all finally got back together to record This Is This, you did it at Dan's studio in Atlanta, where you now live. You were doing it by yourself. And this is after working with an incredible producer with Dave Siddick on Healer, who works with all sorts of people like, yeah, yeah, yeahs. And you kind of had that person to help you with production. And then all of a sudden you guys are doing this in Daniel's studio and you're back together again. You haven't been together physically for a while. And it must have been terrifying, but also just considering the product really exhilarating. And did you feel really overwhelmed? And was there an aha moment where you guys realized that you could do this with this kind of approach? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that was sort of the magic of this pandemic for us was that the amount we're told by specifically like our label and people we work with like oh you guys should work like we'll have demos and they'll be like oh you should bring it to this producer or this producer or this producer and to be able to hear and complete what we want to do by ourselves without an outside voice and opinion and someone shaping it is actually feel so honest like to do it alone is actually, that was the gift. Like we can do this. And that doesn't mean don't ever work with a producer, like whoever's listening. It's, it can be. Well, that was a logistical impossibility. So, I mean. To not have someone kind of interrupt your lyrical process or your melody or, you know, like, oh, this doesn't lift enough or this isn't catchy enough. You know, those moments that can scar a song, especially depending mm -hmm. on what state the song is in. So we got to do that alone and it was really special. This album of anything, it was, it just taught us like, we are enough, you know what I mean? And we can do right. it. We can do it and we can do it for free, which is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> it was very fucking cool. And you touched on this, but we should talk more about it. Your role as a vocalist on this album was kind of unprecedented for you as a group. And I think you sound so rad on it. I love your tone. I love just the way that you guys come out guns blazing with the sequence of this record. And I do believe in sequencing and listening to an album in its entirety, even though we're in a singles driven world, that was something that really colored my experience listening to this is this is how you arrange the songs all together. But what did your label and, and the people that you, fi once you finally did let in the outside world and other opinions, what was their response to this 
departure because it was a bit of a departure in in a wonderful way an evolution yeah coming from the the artist's perspective we're just trying to grow and write and experiment and get to our truth and i personally have been on the journey of trying to find my voice i've been singing for like 12 years now and i feel like at this album it's the most honest reflection of who i am like and it sounds like me it sounds like like my closest friends are calling me and they're like yo this sounds like you like this a lot of earlier songs, like I'm writing and I'm writing sort of through the eyes of me as a gentler person or as a more feminine or I don't, I don't know, just like I'm getting to know who I am mm-hmm. through my voice over the years. And a lot of times I sang way higher than honestly I felt comfortable. I'd lose my voice a lot after shows because I'm just singing in this register that's like, <laughs> you know, whatever. It works for the song. But honestly, as my voice, it didn't feel particularly honest, I guess. So, yeah, so we delivered this album. And I think the biggest thing a lot of people were like is, hey, can you guys get Christian's voice on more songs singing lead? This doesn't sound like a group love album or, wow, Hannah, you're screaming a lot in this album. It's pretty aggressive. Like, is this the group love way? Like, look and at I'm, the year we've just had. I know. <laughs> Don't exactly. you think some aggression is in order? <laughs> And we like, you know, embraced our mistakes in the recording, which a lot of times you go back and Andrew would record his guitar parts a hundred times. I do a million vocals and, you know, and you just pick it apart. And like when my voice cracked or we hit a bunk note, like we were like, this is amazing. And we're recording it all live. It was just so fun and perfect for what we wanted to, you know, accomplish. And so to get reviews that were kind of like, I mean, yeah, this is cool, but like, where's the single, you know, (laughs) Yeah. for us, you know, this is this, it's exactly what it is. We we put it out to be exactly what it is. And so this is like the first album. I haven't read any reviews on it actually, except for the first one. I don't know if you've heard other interviews, but the first review I read was this dude who ran a blog who was like, this is the worst album that I've heard in the last decade. I I have not heard this. (laughs) I I was talking about it because we're going to print a shirt with the review on it. Yes. It's, it's just so funny. It's so mean. And just like the dude hates every song and breaks down why he hates them. And I was just like, this is amazing. Sounds like this. he's got a, a personal motivation here. I was just laughing because I, I haven't felt ever that we put out such a cohesive body of work that I honestly, I know what I got from it. And we knew there was no audience involved immediately. Like you can't perform it. So to put something out and not be like, shit, we shouldn't have put that song on, or I wish I worked those lyrics out more. Like, this isn't that album. So this is this is this. I'm just I'm happy with it. Well, screw that guy. I have not heard of his review, and it's probably because he's not a really legitimate journalist. And the reviews that I have read are with publications that I respect and they are all glowing. And I think that it's always exciting for me as an artist if I feel like the reviews that I'm getting back from trusted people who are well-intentioned are that I'm shaking things up or pushing the envelope because I think that that's our job as artists is to challenge the status quo. And a label's job is to not fix what ain't broke. You know, it's scary for them to see something that has been working. Yeah, we're like, dude, we're never going to write tongue-tied again. Like, get over it. <laughs> right, <laughs> which didn't you, and you wrote that at the commune in Greece, right? No, we wrote that, like, when we all met up in LA again, I just, we smoked a fat joint and, like, wrote that song. Christian wrote that piano part, like, two days before, and then he was playing it at Ryan's house, and we were like, I started singing Take Me to Your Best Friend's House, and I just remember Christian yeah. being like, He's like, we're never singing that line. He's like, that's yeah. not cool. He's like, that's you not showed cool. Him. Like, You're like, no, we're going to actually sing it like on every late night show ever. We're never going to stop singing that. Like that song genuinely came from a fun moment with us all celebrating kind of being reunited, you know? That's how Tongue Tied yeah. came to be. It wasn't like some go in the factory, you know? And, and right. It doesn't feel that way. It feels fun and free and not every lyric has to be 
retrieve from the depths of our souls. You guys are also here to entertain. We're here to entertain. I mean, we were talking about this before we started, but like the idea of performing again, just performing anything. I will perform the first songs we ever wrote. I don't give a shit. I've talked about this with other people, you know, because there was the baking phase at the beginning of the pandemic. And then like a lot of people I know has got really into like hit workouts and running and meditation. I was just like, I am not getting that thing that I get when I play live. Like I am not mm. getting that from anything. I cannot sex my way out of this. I cannot. There's this pandemic like has shown me just, and I know we were talking about this for you too, like without our fans and that give and take on stage, like, who am I? <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. And it sounds so dramatic to say that, but I need them as a reflection. Just a reflection is exactly what I feel like. Like we are a reflection of one another and it's without them, you're like, we're lost. There's a sense of loss. Like there's been a huge sense of loss this year. So you said you're in Atlanta now. In fact, you've just gotten through an official move during COVID, but you've been all over the map just from New York City, your time in Greece, your time in Los Angeles, and just the whirlwind in which you guys got signed from the forming of your band and then having Tongue Tied be so massive and then the success that followed and staying with Atlantic Records. What is the importance of moving geographically to your music, if any. Looking for space has always been a thing. <laughs> we, we like, we started in New York, we're in a tiny apartment in bed and I'm a visual artist always. So I always need a space to paint. So we moved to LA, we got more space. We had the yard, like the sun. We we're still in a tiny little place. And um, yeah, Atlanta just offered more space. I think also it's just, exciting it's not like starting again because we're you know with our band and with people we love but you know everything is heightened when you move too and it's exciting it's like things smell different feels different it, it feels like a new chapter and I, I do like to mark my life with chapters I think you know with albums with series of drawings with things like that and it certainly worked out that way from where I'm standing too your story is unfolded in a really really cool way. It's like, whoa, motherhood, that's huge. Wait a minute, brain surgery, that's huge. And then just what you've dealt with as a band collectively and what you've sustained to come through. And then also how your physical moves have kind of correlated with that is very interesting. Christian, and I talk about this a lot, but there is no reason when you are an artist to have to be anywhere. So you know, I was feeling in Los Angeles and I'm, I'm like grateful the time we had there, but there's an element of obsession with the industry and with Instagram and with beauty and with staying young. And like, as a woman who's a mother getting older, like, I just want to be in a place where I can be myself and make art. And I'm kind of a weirdo. I'm sort of low maintenance and kind of grungy, you know? So <laughs> I was just feeling kind of like an outcast in LA in a way and just and not in a creative way sometimes mm -hmm. being an outcast can be a good thing but I was I had tired of the city my sense of comparison is always heightened when I'm there and I feel like I get a lot done when I go there and there's of course so many people and reasons to go there but I'm always happy that it's a visit because there is this feeling of inadequacy that just kind of bubbles under the surface at all times, even with the great things going on. And I think that's such a time sucker too. It's, it's a waste. And, and bringing up Willa in that environment would probably be something that's just always in the back of your mind and wanting her to not be exposed to that constant awareness of self-importance and how we measure that. There's also something it's sort of sad. I mean, a lot of people move there to be famous and like, what is being famous? Being successful, like looking for connections is one thing or finding your, like, it just, there's a, like inevitably this hollowness when you really are like looking into that, especially like Hollywood, you know, it's a hard place to be. So yeah, it wasn't exciting anymore. I want to be, I mean, we still have a chapter that we haven't lived yet, but we want to live in Europe for at least a year, maybe two, but what is being part of the ATL community 
been like? I know you've been working with this director on a lot of your visuals, especially what Oxygen Swimming, Isaac Dietz, and he's Atlanta based. And have you found a nice community there? Yeah, I feel like, you know, art for art's sake, that's like what I'm really taking. It's cheaper here. So I feel like there's a lot more artists and a lot of people. It's not to show it and necessarily not even to share it. It's just people being creative. I am honestly inspired by that. And I'm inspired by people that aren't artists. It's nice to be around people that are just doing the real shit, teaching and nurses and chefs. And I got to say, seasons. My God, did I miss them? Right. (laughs) Oh my God. The passing of time. Like it's important for me to feel it. Like the thunder and rain and lightning. Like I haven't heard any of that since tour on the East Coast. Yeah, the demarcations of time don't really exist in LA. Around Christmas time, it's warm and balmy. And I think that for someone who cares about chapters of their life, it's nice to have also that in a physical form. I've been in Maryland for two weeks where I grew up and I planted all my plants and seeds before I left. And my friend's been checking on them. She's like, it's rained every day in Nashville here and we've had an actual spring. So I'm not worried about my little seedlings, but yeah, it's, it's important. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying my conversation with the incredibly fascinating and resilient Hannah Hooper. And I don't know about you, but she totally blew my mind when she told the story about pulling the angel card that said death on the day that she was going in to get brain surgery and just how she brushed it off and went in there with such strength to take care of what she had to do for her health and the health of her family. And I found myself throughout this conversation genuinely feeling this little sister, big sister connection with her where I was asking her for advice because she's living proof that she's handled all these crazy things that have been thrown at her with tremendous grace and fearlessness. And she kindly gave me advice in a way that I think only Hannah Hooper can. She's not pontificating to me. She's just kind of saying, this is what we do and this is how we live to the fullest and with no fear. That's such a deterrent for creativity. So let's get back to Hannah's story. And I hope you feel as inspired by her today as I did when we had this conversation. Also, she had boxes piled around her because she had just moved literally days before this conversation. And she was calm as could be, whereas maybe other people might be freaking out with all the chaos going on like that around them. Not Hannah. Here we go. Does it even matter to you that you are lady group love or do you feel like gender is just not even on your mind or what is your role as a woman and the significance of that in this outfit that you're in? Privately gender, I feel like it has never been an issue for me. On stage, however, I find that I this like sexy woman comes out, this naughty, dirty, like. (laughs) Yeah, you wear a bodysuit like no one else. Everyone needs to Google Hannah Hooper bodysuit. And what's funny is like offstage, I'm in like giant clothes. So I think there's (laughs) just, there's something about who I am on stage that I love feeling powerful and sexy. And like, I love my curves and I love shaking my ass on stage. And I love that Mm -hmm. feeling. And and I love it being Shake that ass on camera. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That part of me I miss too, because I don't feel her off stage, you know, so Totally. When I'm on stage, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. When I'm on stage, I'm like, what's up, dude? <laughs> I'm not super didactic in that way either. That's where I like want to ooze that sexuality on stage. And things that I'm passionate about 
sociopolitically. Like the stage is where I take that and just feeling that cut off and being a woman plays into that so much. There's a strength in femininity that I think I can only tap into there. But I also feel like I've been neglecting your bandmates and not talking about them enough and how they perceive you. There's this like protection, this adoration for you from your brothers and collaborators who also could maybe like have a crush on you too, because that's how it goes. We're just goofy together, you know, like, I feel like I'm kind of like their sister and their mother at the same time. Like I, oh, it's a big job. It's a big job, but I, I honestly I enjoy it. I mean, that's one of the things is like, we are so reclusive as artists, like making work all the time that when I wasn't with them, I it really amplified how close I am to them. And it, they're kind of the only reason it's okay that I'm so reclusive. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, because I have my friends who also create with me. So it's okay that we're shut off from the world 80% of the time. I mean, that's the power of music. We have this language together that is so far beyond friendship. It's like we know each other tonally, <laughs> you know? Right. Music can definitely provide that too. It's a, a different language, which is another force of bonding that you and Christian probably share. Just having that love language of music that isn't relying on words. You guys talk a lot about your partnership with the Ally Coalition, which supports the LGBTQ Black youth. And I think that goes really into the message that you guys push out there of love and inclusivity and how you treat each other and how you treat your fans and What's the importance of that if you want to speak to it? I'm working so much with Every Mother Counts right now that I'm like, because that's a charity that I've been able to like work with during the pandemic. But Ally Coalition is an amazing space just to keep the LGBTQ community safe, you know, and have a place to go. In my mind, I work with one charity at a time and I'm working with Every Mother Counts right now, which is to, if you don't know about them, Christy Charlington, who is a lot of people know her as a famous supermodel. She mm-hmm. had a really complicated birth and it got her, I think it was 15 years ago, maybe she started this charity basically to bring health care to all women so that women don't die giving birth or their children don't die giving birth. And as a mom, it hit close to home. I had a very strange birth myself and Chris and I have been doing a lot of stuff with them. That's awesome. And I mean, the mortality rate between white mothers and black mothers is still, there's a big discrepancy. So I think that's a wonderful organization to work with. All right. So your artwork, we'll end with your amazing visual artwork that you've done on all your records. But I really love This Is This, especially because there's a line about smashing your face in a cake and celebrating on deadline, which is one of the ways in which you announced this album. What is the medium that you're using for this cover? I did that cover with this guy, Julian Gross, who's a good friend of mine in Los Angeles. And that was, we did it the day before we left, the day before Christian Will and I drove to Atlanta. And we were just like, shit, we're in this pandemic. We want to do a cover that is a celebration, but in sort of a strange way. So we just started really just talking about like, well, what if you went into a house and it was like supposed to be a party, but there was a cake on the ceiling? What would that look like? And we were just, we wanted like an upside down celebration. So that's what. Well, it looks like there's a middle finger on the top. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a little, there's a finger pointing through. Um, It's like a glory hole. (laughs) I know that's what we were talking about. We're like, we used all our money on the whole album to get Brad Pitt to stick his finger through that. <laughs> money well spent. Well, I think all of your album covers are thought provoking and abstract, which is, I think, the point. And you say that you work a lot from your subconscious. And with the title, This Is This, was that always going to be the title of the album? Or No, so the title was going to be This Is The End, which is a track on the album. Yes. We felt doomed, obviously, during the pandemic. I think everyone at some point thought this is the end. And we're making margaritas one night at the studio. And I Dan lets me draw all over his studio walls. So I was writing 
above this what arch. What a nice bandmate. He's so sweet. Dan is, yeah. he's the best. But anyway, I should yes, probably paint over <laughs> some of the studio. <laughs> anyway, I was writing, this is the end over an archway. And I probably had like three margaritas or just like way too many for me. I honestly am a lightweight. And I, I wrote, this is this. And I stepped back and was like, oh shit. And then we were all looking at it. We're like, you know what? This is this. I mean, it was really that simple. It was just, I messed up the words. And then as we step back, as things do, sort of like when you don't necessarily understand a song a hundred percent, and then you're singing it on stage and suddenly the meaning you're like, oh my God, this song means so much more to me all of a sudden. Have you had those moments? All the time. Songs rarely ever mean the same thing from month to month. Yeah. It started sort of as a joke and now it makes more sense than anything else. (laughs) Hannah, you're the shit. I salute you. I'm so thankful that you were so generous with your time and your story on this busy video release day of yours and congratulations on the move. And thank you. This was awesome. That's a wrap. You can follow Hannah on her socials at lady group love. Also give the band a follow as well at, at group love, check out their new album. This is this along with some merchandise. They just rolled out designed by Hannah Hooper herself. It's pretty rad. And to keep up with me, my music, and my touring calendar, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at I am Maggie Rose. Go check out my brand new album that just came out on August 20th. It's called Have a Seat. Find out where we're touring on my website, maggierosemusic.com, and come see us on the Have a Seat tour. And you can get exclusive Sleuth of Songbird content along with new music, live stream concerts, and more if you follow me on With the Band. You've been listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. The executive producers are Kirsten Cluthy and Brad Stratton from Osiris Media and Austin Marshall. And the show is edited and mixed by Brad Stratton. Original music by Maggie Rose. Please subscribe to Salute the Songbird on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast content. And if you like the show, recommend it to a friend or leave us a review so that others can join the conversation. And to close out the show, here is Deadline from This Is This by Group Of.
Osiris.